friends. Uncle Marv here with another episode of the IT Business Podcast, your podcast for IT business support, where we share product stories and tips, all in an effort to help you run your business better, smarter, and faster. This is the live show, so if you're watching us on YouTube or the Facebook, welcome. If you are listening by audio, you've caught us after we recorded, and we thank you for downloading and subscribing to the show. Either way, you can always head over to itbusinesspodcast.com and get everything listed in the show notes. You can find past episodes. You can support the show, which I hope you guys do. Uh, But that's where you can go to find out everything we do here all in the IT channel. Tonight, I am joined by good friend, business owner, Tom Bull with Two River Computers. Tom, how are you? Hey, Marv. Good to see you again. Good to see you. It has been a while, and uh, we will see each other in about a month. Yeah, it's coming up quick. It is. And um, when I say we'll see each other, for those that do not know, Tom and I will be attending the TechCon Unplugged, which is the annual Tech for Tech Business Conference uh, this year in Chicago, put on by our good friends Paco and Rick over at MSP Unplugged. And Tom has, I think you've attended, have you attended every one that we've done? The the only, well, all of the tech cons, uh, I came into the to the picture at um, Unconvention, but at Unconvention number two, I missed Toronto. Okay. But I've, I've been there since DC, so okay. however long that is. All right. Well, it is a good event and uh, it is a great time to share stories and stuff with other business owners. We learn side by side with the vendors. And let's see, last year you brought one of your technicians with you. Are you going to be doing that again? I did. I brought Vanessa with us last year. Uh, what I'm, I'm bringing this year is Fernando. Fernando's our uh, network engineer. So I thought it would be a good idea for him to rub elbows with smart people like you and uh, and the others that show up and uh, and see if we can form some relationships for him when he gets back. All right. So did Vanessa give him a heads up that he might win stuff? She was trying to discourage him from winning <laughs> stuff. <laughs> she said, that's for the Millers. Don't, don't win anything. Yeah. They I, get mad. They get mad when they don't. Win. They, they do. They do. But uh, we're going to, we're going to see about putting a little squash to that this year. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. That's funny. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and do some quick announcements since we brought up TechCon. The live show here is presented to you by NetAlly. Net Ally. They are the number one ally of network professionals. They provide handheld tools that are what I consider best in class, and they help you to effectively plan, install, validate, and troubleshoot virtually any wired or wireless network problem you can come across. Uh, They are a fantastic partner. The video for the live show is sponsored by Computers Done Right, managed service company in Southwest Florida. And not only do they handle your managed services, your IT support and computer repairs, they also do website design and social media marketing. So for all your computer repair needs, go to computersdoneright.com. And of course, we mentioned TechCon Unplugged this year in Chicago, Illinois, September 16th and 18th. Tom and I will be there with other IT professionals, and it should be a fantastic time. You can head over to TechCon Unplugged and get your ticket. I think there's just a few left. And if you use the discount code IT. BP 75 off. You will obviously save $75 off the ticket price and you will join us and have a fantastic time. So once again, techconunplugged.com. Use the promo code ITBP75 off. All right. So tonight we are going to have a very different discussion. And before we jump in, I just want to give a note about the content tonight, folks. Normally, I will do the best that I can to keep the separation of church and state out of the podcast. (laughs) In this particular case, we may actually get up to the line and step over it. So I want to just let everybody know up front that that might happen. 
And if it does, we apologize if it's something that you want to avoid. So I'm letting you know ahead of time, if it is something you want to avoid, you can skip this podcast and we'll see or hear you on the next one. But I just want to let you know that may or may not happen. And we will talk tech because obviously what you did, Tom, I think was in my mind, extraordinary. Now I know when we put out the title and the content, some people were saying, Oh no, business owners should do this all the time. Uh, But there's a lot of us who don't. And when I say do this all the time, you took, was it an entire month off? Six weeks, six weeks. That's, that's huge. (laughs) Of course that is huge. I mean, it's huge. Yes. It's huge. So let's first talk about why you wanted to do that because that you you just don't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to be gone tomorrow. I'll see you in six weeks. Right? (laughs) No, there was a, there was a lot of thought that went into it. Um, I, I had been talking, you know, maybe to you and others uh, on more than one occasion, other uh, business owners, certainly IT business owners, but other business owners that I know of that uh, like me were tired. Um, working a lot, um, running out of gas is the way I refer to it a lot. I think you said we're old is what one of the phrases. Well, that could be it too. I'm getting tired. (laughs) And, but you know, I, I, when I go back and I analyze it, I feel like I didn't pace myself right. Like started the business, um, 17 years ago and I should have paced it for 22 or 23 years, but I was kind of out of gas and, um, just had, you know, just running out. So I had talked to other business owners about this before that I really felt, and I don't know why I felt this, but I felt like if we could take some real time off, not just two weeks or three weeks, but like some real substantial amount of time that we could kind of disconnect um, from our daily life, our daily grind and kind of re-energize, recharge and reinvigorate ourselves and kind of give ourselves some clarity about what we're going to do next. Um, to help us get to the finish line. And I, I've used that before in another podcast um, talking about that because that was a big part of why I felt I needed to do it, that I was running out of gas. So let's go back and, and flesh out one little point you put in there, because I think from a business owner perspective, a lot of us start our businesses in tech because we either are disenfranchised with, you know, a computer store we work at or, you know, whatever other business that we're doing and we start the tech business and most of us aren't necessarily business minded and oriented and we don't have a plan, first of all, to start the business, but we definitely don't have one to end the business. Now you're one of those people that I think has a little bit more of a business acumen and you probably do have an end game in mind. So let me ask, is that true or is this part of that process? Um, well, I'm going to answer yes to both of them because yes, it's true. And, and I didn't know it was going to be part of the process, but now that I've done it, uh, I feel like it's a really important part, uh, of the process. So, uh, I've been in tech for 41 years and, uh, 10 of it with a manufacturer, but the other 31, I was basically running tech businesses, um, not my own, only my own for the last 16 years. So I was kind of doing the same thing, you know, kind of over and over. So I was getting kind of burnt out on it. But I do understand uh, the business side of it. And I say it to you guys all the time when I'm in the room, uh, I'm I'm the dumbest uh, technical person in the room because you guys are all so much smarter than I am technically. But I feel like I might have a leg up uh, just because I have 30 years of experience running tech business. But yeah, the end game. I mean, why do you why do you start a business? I guess you could write a list of the reasons you said it, you know, disenfranchised with your current situation. Um, You know, you want to be your own boss or, you know, you feel like you've got this great idea and nobody has a plan. I mean, I had a plan and I wrote it 16 years ago and I haven't touched it since and it's changed dramatically. And I think that's probably common uh, for people who do write a plan, but many of uh, many small business owners don't have a plan and I definitely have an end game. I've got options though now, which I wasn't, um, I didn't think I had until I had a chance to stop thinking for a minute. Um, and that kind of came to me. Now you mentioned that you had a plan, haven't touched it for 16 years, but I'm sure you've thought about it in a sense, 
How much has that plan changed in your mind from when you first started? Well, I, I bet if you polled 100 business owners, they would say that their goal at the end uh, is to sell it. Um, because when you really get down to it, when you get close enough where you're thinking about how much money do I need every year to live the way I want to live, you, you start to look at it and you say, well, I could sell my business now and I could get three years of retirement or five or 10. And um, coupled with your retirement um, strategy, you know, you may have, like I have, uh, I've worked really hard to get 20 years worth of retirement money, which I kind of had till the last couple quarters of uh, decline. But um, with 20 years of retirement, um, if I retire today, I'll be 80 years old. I'm, I'm hopefully going to live longer than that. So I need more. So um, I'm counting on my business to give me some number of years. Um, and, and I think that should be part of everybody's plan. Like, what are you going to do at the end? You need to formulate a plan. For some people, they sell it quickly. They get in, they sell it, they buy another or start another one and sell that one because they're smarter now and they're better at it and, and they can make more money and kind of leapfrog, almost like how you uh, buy and sell homes. So I think for some people, that's an angle. Um, not the same for me and probably not for you either. But, you know, once we've ridden it as far as we can ride it and we're tired, we got to do something. Selling it's a logical thing. Yep. Now, are you going to sell and just walk away or are you going to stay involved in some form or fashion? Um, I mean, this is your yeah, baby. This is, yeah, great question, right? I mean, it, it, everybody um, who owns a business, it's their baby, right? So, and it's like a child. You raised it. You, you, taught it how to feed itself and you taught it how to ride a bike and how to save for a rainy day. And you did all of these things and you nurtured it and, and it grew and now it's healthy. And, and so what do you do? And it's hard to separate, I think, emotionally uh, from it. Right. And, and if you can manage to do that and you can look at it fiscally, then you, you start analyzing your options. Um, and I think for me, I've got a couple, um, my particular business, kind of has three silos, which I may have mentioned to you, that it's a repair shop, it's an MSP. And we also do a thing I call infotainment, which is basically residential entertainment stuff, TV, sound system, smart home. And each of those silos generate about the same amount of revenue, uh, the MSP slightly more. Um, so I could sell off one or some of them and still have something remaining uh, that could throw off some money. And if I kept it going and removed myself, um, it could pay me a portion. Like I wouldn't expect it to pay me full boat, but if I left and it paid me half or 25% or 30% of what I'm making now, that would be a wonderful thing. And if I could get somebody to earn in while I earn out, then I could go 20 years making a much smaller amount of money. And it's almost like an annuity. Um, so there's a couple, there's a couple of things, outright sale is a thing, um, not selling any of it and just kind of coming in one day a week, um, and, you know, kind of making the big decisions maybe. Um, so I, I feel good that I've got a lot of options. So one of those options that I was going to ask you about later, but I'll move it up till now is, is the option of continuing in the business. Like you said, maybe only coming in one day a week. Uh, you were able to take off six weeks, be completely removed, yeah. aside from some check-ins, from what I understand. Right. Um, has that now opened up the door now to where you might be able to step back and let the business go? You're still there if you need to be or if you want to be. Yeah, another great question. I I think that... Um, for my particular situation, what I knew was going to happen when I left is that revenue was going to suffer. I didn't, I didn't think that the operation would, you know, uh, would falter at all or that they would be faced with a decision that they couldn't make. I, I kind of challenged uh, my staff, our staff to, um, to step up and to realize their full potential. And I, I felt like for a while that I've empowered them to make the decisions and to do the right thing, which is one of our mantras. And they have, and they know that they can. And when you walk away for six weeks, um, you kind of force their hand and, and make them make those decisions and, and um, 
deploy those strategies and behaviors. And, and it works out. It worked out in my case. So, I mean, to be able to say, could I walk away? Um, I'll say yes and no. The revenue suffered, which I knew was going to happen, but I was ready for it. Um, I had stockpiled some cash and I was prepared to give it all up. Um, I didn't have to, thank God, but I was prepared to because I was so committed to uh, to doing to taking this journey that uh, I was ready to do that. But now that I'm back, um, I am completely refocused. And what's wonderful is many of us small tech business owners, their um, tool bag comes out of their car or truck every day, whether it be a net ally uh, device or uh, a Phillips head screwdriver or, you know, the phone to Google something, you're, you're, you're working in the business and less on it. And now I'm working more on it and I've been back for six weeks and, and uh, I haven't been in my truck once. Um, and so that part of it is huge that um, I'm, I'm not out doing stuff or I felt compelled to do stuff. So it's forced me or allowed me, I should say, allowed me to stay back and, and analyze things that I've kind of neglected because I was too busy working in it. Uh, looking at uh, fine tuning process, looking at uh, things that are happening in our shop, things that are happening with contracts, uh, and most importantly, selling. Um, it's a thing I, I enjoy the most. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure it's what I'm best at, but I, I like it the most. So I like to sell and to market and to do those things. And it's allowed me the opportunity to do it. And since I've been back, I mean, sales have been uh, zany, um, really like way better than I expected. So now let's go back to the point you made about refocus, because this all began some time ago. And, and I'm assuming it was months before you actually made the decision to do the walk. Was there a, what's the right word I'm looking for? Was there a moment where you thought, you know, I've lost focus. I need to regenerate. I need to reinvigorate. I need to do something. Is that kind of the trigger for you that started this? I don't, I'm going to say yes, kind of, okay. uh, because I don't feel it was like a, you know, it, it wasn't like a light bulb. It was kind of like that slow burn um, where, I mean, I'm like snapping at everybody and, um, and I'm, and, and, and the one thing in particular is I felt that I wasn't being present. And, and what I mean by that is uh, I would have conversations with people, whether it's a family member, my wife, uh, coworker, friend, or even listening uh, to my pastor at church and they're, they're talking and I'm thinking about something else. It might be work. It might be golf. I don't know what it is, but I, I, I just wasn't present. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking and I, I wasn't absorbing. I wasn't in the moment. So I was more like not paying attention to the journey and, and being more focused on the destination. And that's a crappy, crappy way uh, to live your life. So when I, when I felt like I, I wanted to practice what I preach because I was, I've told Marvin, if I tell you that I've told 50 people, 50 business owners that they need to take time off so that they could come back and come back strong because I felt like I just wanted to be done. There was a couple of things that had happened, a couple of events, whether they were customer based or employee based, which is a whole nother kind of show. But, um, you know, that, that made you question whether you wanted to continue. Like, uh, do I want to keep doing this? It's like, is it worth the drama? I wasn't having any health issues. I wasn't having any emotional or mental crisis or, or anything like that at all. But I was like, I'm being kind of a jerk and I'm not, I'm not paying attention uh, to life. Um, and it, it felt like something needed to happen. So I'm like, I'm going to practice what I preach and I'm going to find time and I'm going to figure out a way to get some real time. And, and that's not sitting on the beach because sitting on the beach, even if for six weeks, which sounds really groovy, but sitting on the beach for a long time, you you got your phone, you, you're out, you're doing stuff, you're, you're answering emails and, and you can't, I don't think I could really disconnect that way. And doing what I did because of the time change, the time zone, six hours ahead, it kind of forced me to be on do not disturb. Uh, Plus the things that I did in advance to prepare for that uh, made it easier for me to do that. But I I don't think there was like, you know, some kind of switch that went that said, I got to do this. It had kind of been building and I'd been 
listening to, to cues and to signals, you know, not in the universe, but just kind of around. Um, and there was a movie called The Way that talked about uh, walking across Spain. And I'm like, wow, that sounds really good. I, I'm walking across Spain. I, I'm, I'm a walker as it is. I, I stopped running and I started walking. And then um, I had made a New Year's resolution in 2019 to learn Spanish. So it seemed like a kind of a logical thing. I'm like, wow, these things kind of go together. Um, let me research that. And my research said, wow, this is like a really good fit for me. So I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm in my mind thinking of all the times that I've had to do just that, where I'm like, ooh, something's not right and I need to step back. And sometimes it comes in the form of a customer who's talking to my wife and going, is Marvin okay? He seems a little grumpy. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, he is. I don't talk to him either. So, and uh, all those sorts of things. Now, I don't have, let's shall we say, a good history when it comes to the religious sector. But I did spend three years in North Carolina at a seminary at what I call the three years of darkness. Oh, wow. And that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> but that's I, a whole nother show. Yeah, that's. But I will go through periods where I will be listening to music, which will help me to get in a mode of refocus. And, you know, everybody thinks that I'm just a big country music listener. That's not true. I do that to annoy people. So I listen to all types of it, music. It, it works, Marvin. It works. <laughs> Um, but I also, you know, like, you know, I listen to, uh, you know, the, uh, God, their name escapes me, but, um, the, you're Irish, right? I am. What's the, uh, what's the, the musical group that tours around the, uh, Oh, the river dance guys, those guys. Well, there's that. And then there's the one with the, the girls, um, the Miss Celtic women, Celtic woman. Oh, you don't know that? Don't. Okay, that's another show too. <laughs> yeah, it is. We start kind of start writing this down. Yeah, so I listen to that. I do jazz. I found myself, you know, going through the Christian contemporary music, listening to all the music yeah. from the eighties and nineties, blah blah blah. So you're right. We need to do those things as business owners, and you know, especially in the tech world, we we grind probably mm. harder than most. Mm. Well, I'm glad it's, I'm glad it's not physical. Think about that. Like if you were in a trade, right. you know, electrician well, and plumber, you know, that, that takes its toll too. Well, it right? is, it's a mental grind. You know, it's yeah. one of those things where a lot of jobs say the trades, for instance, you know, they do their job. And if they do it from seven in the morning to seven at night, they're done. They go home. That's it. Yeah. They don't have to do anything until the next day. Whereas a lot yeah. of us, we go home and we're, think, we're still thinking about that server that, yeah. you know, didn't patch right. And, yeah. you know, if a server gets stuck in a boot loop, we've got to, you know, keep working on it. You know, we've got alerts. You know, we're managed service providers 24-7. You know, we're checking the phone to see what that alert was. I, I envy those people a lot, the, the ones that are lucky enough to be able to turn it off. But I think their life is different, right? I mean, it's got to be. I mean, we kind of chose this and maybe it kind of chose us. But, you know, here we are. We are techno heroes or something, right? Everybody thinks like it's so funny. Like you could be in the airport and uh, the computers are down. So we so the air traffic control can't route any airplanes. And so somebody will go, well, you know, computers, can't you go fix that? <laughs> so everybody thinks that we know everything about everything. And that's a little heady, right? Um, and a lot of times we do know uh, the stuff. And I, hey, I, I won't deny that I like, I like how I look in a cape. And uh, people think I'm a little bit of a, of a superhero. And, and that fuels me in a different way. But yeah, I think, uh, I think those that get to shut it off, I, I think they're they live a different kind of life than us for sure. Yeah. So all of this comes down to we as technicians, business owners need to know when to back off, when to rejuvenate, when to, you know, set aside time. And, you know, I've had to do that earlier this year with the health of my mom, you know, when mm -hmm. she got put in the hospital and I just said, look, I'm taking time off. Um, that's a little different because that's something physical that I can point to, everybody else can see it. But when it comes to the mental, 
when it comes to, you know, I'm going to say the spiritual, because when, you know, Mm -hmm. inside, you know, people can't see that other people for the most part, can't feel it unless, you know, you're just, you know, un you know, losing it, I guess is the best way to say it. (laughs) Um, So this had to be something of a mental slash physical slash spiritual journey for you, because from what I hear, the uh, El Camino de Santiago, it's not something you just go and, you know, it's not a walk in the park. No, no. So I'm going to start with the first thing that you said. So health, um, and you could define as physical health, mental health, emotional health, right? So, um, I used to go to church. I'm Catholic. So I went to Catholic school all my life. Um, and so it's a part of me and, and I would go to church every day. Uh, and I was calling it yoga for my soul. So, and then I would come home and I would do yoga. <laughs> um, and those two things, it was like kind of body and mind uh, kind of stuff, kind of really helped me. It, it energized me in a couple different ways. You know, if you've, and you clearly have worked out in your life that, um, did you see, I gave you a little compliment there. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, especially if you do it in the morning, uh, it, it fuels you kind of for the day, right? I mean, it, it lets you burn your calories faster and you, you have more energy. And, you know, some people like to do it at the end of the day. I can't cause I get too revved up. I can't sleep, but um, to, to find the balance in the administration of your own health, um, I think is really important. And, you know, I've witnessed, and you have too, I'm sure online and blogs and, and forums and stuff where, where people are, trolling or just commenting and it's like wow this dude's having a bad bad day um and you know you want to kind of help them and steer them to try and do something about their own health and and i think that doing things whatever it it is for you uh whether it's yoga or or church or music or uh you know the gym or whatever it is i think it's important that we all do it because otherwise it just becomes a grind and you get up you know it's like lather, rinse and repeat. And, and that's going to just build up a lot of um, negativity um, in your life. If you feel like you're going nowhere, you're on a treadmill, you know? Yeah. So now taking a step back and looking at you getting to the point where this is what you're going to do. I do want to let people know, and I probably should have said this earlier. There are a couple of podcasts that I'm going to put links in the show notes to where you go into much more detail than, than we can tonight about what the Camino is, uh, your journey and preparing for it, and then your feedback after the fact. Uh, but I just want to ask in terms of you know what it means for us on this show in this forum, what did it mean to step away for the biz- from the business and take on I'm going to call it a challenge, I guess, the way yeah. that the way that you've yeah. described it in the other podcast. Um, yeah. This was kind of a challenge for you, right? Yeah, in in a couple of ways. And um, once I had realized that I wanted to do this uh, and with the support of my wife and family um, and 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 certainly from my work wife, Phyllis, that um she runs the joint over there, you know, and I was like, listen, I'm going to do this and it's going to be a while, but it's okay. So I started to do the planning part and, and as a business owner, and this was kind of the podcast angle uh, for the Camino podcast that I did, I, I approached the podcaster and I said, listen, I, I, I have a, an angle or two. And one was a before and after, because I was at the point where I had figured out all the physical part. Uh, meaning I got the shoes and I got the backpack and I got the socks and the right underwear and a lot of research in the right underwear. Marvin. Well, so, I'm sure, you, you know, I mean, seriously, so I know that sounds funny and people are laughing and no, Diana, I know is sleeping just like an, right just now. like an athlete. You got it. You know, you've got to have the right equipment. You got to have the right gear. So I, I went through all that and I felt really good about that. And then the physical part, I was training uh, and there's a lot of mountains uh, in Northern Spain. So there's a lot of hill training and there's not a lot of hills in New Jersey 
I had the flat part figured out, but I kind of underestimated the hills, but that's another thing. But I felt really uh, physically ready and, and I had all of the material uh, that I needed. So, but I, what I wasn't ready for, I didn't think I was ready for, was kind of the mental, emotional, spiritual part of, of what the Camino means, because it's got this great history to it. It's like over a thousand years old, people have been taking this journey and it's been, and it comes from a bunch of different places throughout Europe and converges uh, in the city of Santiago de Compostela in uh, Northwestern Spain. So there's a, there's a lot to it, right? So I had researched the crap out of that being a tech guy, right? So I researched and found this podcast because I'm like, I kind of reached the end. I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm physically ready to go, but I'm not sure I'm like in the right headspace to go. What do I need to be ready? So I approached this guy and I said, I got two ideas. Let's do a before and after. Um, so my expectation uh, versus the reality. And because so many people I had been reading and, and a number of Facebook groups and, and other forums and stuff that uh, to temper your expectations, because a lot of people, you know, everything from, uh, I don't know, being uh, being forgiven for murdering somebody <laughs> to, you know, just the most banal little thing out there, you, you, you get some kind of reward or you, you, you achieve some kind of enlightenment or something uh, taking this journey and doing this thing. So, you know, I'm kind of keying in on that and I'm like, so, but so temper your expectations, don't expect too much. And I had expectations. I definitely did. And I expressed them to him in part one. And then, uh, I went and did the journey and came back in part two and, you know, we kind of compared and, and he brought to light some things that I, I didn't think enough good stuff happened. And he's like, dude, all of these really cool things happened and you're not even seeing it. And so that, that was an interesting uh, thing that came out of it. But my, so the before and after was a big thing, but the other was the business owner thing. And I said, I think that other business owners are afraid. I think they're afraid to take six weeks um, to be away. They're afraid at the idea of being that guy, the, the podcaster talks about this, the, the guy on the path in Spain on his phone troubleshooting a server. Um, you don't want to be that guy. You you want to be able to really, I mean, disconnecting is one thing and it, it wasn't really about disconnecting. It was about separating. And I, I say that as two different things because disconnecting to me is putting the phone down and putting it on do not disturb. But But separating is when you can give your tasks to somebody else and really not be a business owner for a while and be what they refer to as a pilgrim, be a pilgrim and, and, and walk the walk. So I'm going to backtrack just a little and then I want to move forward because part of what you're talking about is what I call the personal side of business. You know, why did we do this? Did we do this to give ourselves a job? Um, That's probably one of the first things. And, you know, I think you guys talked about Michael Gerber's book um, to work on the business, not in the business. Or maybe yeah, maybe you just mentioned that the e myth, yeah. um, but a lot of it is the fact that a lot of business owners are control freaks yeah, man. and can't delegate properly, and you know some of that comes back to why you did the business. You know why are you in business? Why do you have employees if you don't let them do their jobs? And the best businesses are ones where the owners can delegate and leave them alone, let them go do their jobs. So I commend you for being able to do that. I'll be honest. Um, I don't know if I could, at least not for that period of time. Part of it is me. Part of it is I can't be away for three days. I mean, I think three days is my max where regardless of where I am, I'm thinking I got to be home. I got to get back to it. That's just the way I'm built. I get that. I get that a lot. Uh, I feel you because I, um, my friends, several of my friends own businesses as well. And they'll like do something, whatever that is, you know, just going out for drinks or doing something else. And I'm like, yeah, I can't, you know, I got, I got a job to do, uh, you know, a project to finish or whatever. And I'm like, why, why did I even do this? If I, if I can't, break away and go play golf or go to a bar or, you know, take a day off long weekend, whatever, why the hell did I even do this? And so 
I, I am not, I don't think, I don't think I am a control freak. Um, I've empowered, I feel like I've empowered our staff to make the decisions that they need to make to do their job. And I've written up for them everything that they need um, to be able to execute. And so I allow them to execute. And I, I had taken a class when I was thrust into a management job in a very early age, I was probably 22. And I was managing seven technicians and I went and took a class at the local community college. Um, and one of them was human behavior and another one was, was small business management. And they, they said, you know, a good, um, a good department runs without its manager. And I took that to heart and I'm like, you know, they need to be able to do it. I just felt that it's so dumb. It, this is what I'm going to say next is really dumb that the work that I did was the, was the, the most profitable work meaning it had the cheapest cost um, and it had, it showed the most profit and that's just wrong and stupid. And so I felt like I, I needed to be the one going out and doing, hanging that TV or, you know, installing those computers or running that cable. And that's just wrong. You know, you, you need to make money off of other people. That's the American way. <laughs> um, so, so being that I had already had process, you you all know that I'm a disciple of process and I have it for all of the staff members, what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it um, and how. And so this was an extension of that because of one key thing. I had written up everybody's job from nine to five, so to speak. But what I didn't do was mine. Oh. So, right. So I took two months to write up what I did as a business owner, everything from making deposits in the bank to doing payroll, to paying taxes, all of those things, wrote them all up. And I did it over two months, probably because I didn't think about it until there was two months left to go. Um, but I'm going to say it was because I needed to see the habitual, you know, it comes around um, twice um, during that period. And I wrote it up. And so I, I had this very long document called uh, what to do when Tom's in Spain. <laughs> so everything from the alarm company, I mean, just you name it, a anything that is not a technician fixing a computer, a help de desk person doing a remote fix or a field tech doing an install, all those other things and wrote them all up and, and kind of handed them out. I felt like a Las Vegas, uh, card dealer. I was like, here, you take these and right. you take those. And, and when I come back, you better fall in love with a couple of them. Cause I'm not taking them all back. And that's, and that was clutch because these people are like, yeah, I can do this. And they're doing it and they feel good about it. Even though it's more work, they feel good about it and they're doing it and I'm doing less of it. So now I get to offload even more because of how this went down. So that worked out. That was a real happy accident. So two questions from that one, and I'll start with the employees first. Did they get a sense of empowerment or a sense of ownership in their part of the business now that you've, you know, given all that stuff out? Um, I hope so. So this analogy is quite possibly very, very terrible. So you may have to cut this out. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't uh, edit. <laughs> I know you don't ever edit, do you? So <laughs> uh, we have the car wash here where the car goes through the little thing and you can watch through the window, you know, get a lollipop and then go outside and the guy comes up and, and wipes it down and you tip him or her. And um, what I got in the habit of doing is uh, giving the person that was wiping the car down money in advance uh, before they did the job. And so instead of going, wow, you did a crappy job. Here's two bucks. I would go to them and give them $5 and say, do a really good job. And so the results were always great. I even experimented saying, you know, I'll give you $3 now. And if you do a really good job, I'll give you three more, you know, something like that. So I, I fiddled with that, the human psychology part of me. Um, and I found that just paying them in advance, I got really good work and they were proud and they, and they spent extra time and, and, and they felt that they justified the money that they got. 
So before I left, uh, I sat each one of them down and I gave them an envelope of cash and said, listen, I'm, I'm asking a lot of you uh, and I, I need you to cover for me because I really feel the, the desire to do this and it's going to be better for all of us in the end. But uh, instead of giving you guys a bonus when I come back, if the place is still running and hasn't burnt down, um, I, I'm going to pay you in advance to make sure it doesn't burn down. So that's kind of what I did. And I did it with everyone. I did it at the highest level all the way down to the lowest. Interesting. Uh, I'm sure they appreciate that. And I'm going to ask you a follow up on that later because I want to get to this next question and then finish out some other topics that we okay. bullet pointed here. So when you got to the point that you realized that you had written out your SOPs, I guess, your yeah. instruction yep. manual for every other job in the business, but yours, what was it that made you realize that you had not, because that sounds like you missed a, a point or a page in the disaster recovery book, right? That, you know, no, what no, happens you, if you get you hit by a bus? Me. I, I have always had their SOPs in place. Right. But you didn't have yours. No. So, okay. So then, so then you did understand me and I did blow that. Right. So, I was <laughs> so, going to say, so what got to the point where you realized I did not plan for my getting hit by a bus? So that's funny. I use that analogy all the time. Um, I started to, um, you know, the it starts with payroll, like who's doing payroll, then who's doing taxes, then who's making the, the weekly deposit. And, you know, we have a lot of automation, but you know, there's some manual things that have to happen. And I started to put it on people's calendars. So Phyllis, my work wife, I would say, all right, every Wednesday, you need to do this every Monday, every Friday. So I went to her calendar and I started adding all these events and then to other people's calendars, adding the events. And then, but it, there wasn't enough detail. So I started to write um, and started to document all of it. And then I popped that particular event details into that calendar event so that it popped up for them. They knew exactly what to do. Uh, everything was right there. So um, I guess that this is a really good wake up call for those people maybe who are never going to get the opportunity to be away for this long that you should write that shit up <laughs> yeah. because, because it, uh, it was really cathartic and, and, and also I'm, I fancy myself an efficiency expert. And when I looked at some of the stuff after I had written it, I went back and I'm like, this is terrible. Like I have to, I have to redo this. And I ended up making some significant changes that really, really helped. And, um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily do it. I mean, you might change after you've defined like what a technician does and what a help desk person does and what an AR um, uh, person does. You, you know, you, you typically don't go back and fine tune it unless something happens. Right. Um, well, this is kind of forcing that. Uh, and it was really healthy and really good. Well, the reason I ask that is because I know that when I've gone through that, when I've delegated tasks, you know, to Kim to do stuff and, you know, I think I give her, you know, a good checklist of instructions only to find out that I left out, you know, two key important parts just because, sure. you know, in my mind, it's just on automatic and I do it. Or when I've sent, you know, even my tools, if I have send, a, a, you know, a hard drive duplicator out with a tech you know, and explain, you know, here's what you do. You know, sometimes you got to put, you know, step one, you know, plug it in. <laughs> step two, turn yeah. on. It, it, it's amazing. So when you have to do that for your job, for other people, I just can't imagine all the stuff that got left out. You know, I, I, I have always time blocked, meaning um, in my calendar, if you saw it, um, it says Monday, I have to look at my tickets um, and my estimates and, and Tuesday I do stuff about process and Wednesday is finance and, and et cetera throughout the week. So, so I know what I do during those times. So it wasn't hard for me to say, all right, on Mondays when I'm, when I'm doing this stuff, what, what am I doing? Let me, let me write it out. Um, and then, so what I did is I kind of took, I'll say a month, um, not, you know, beginning to end. I mean, over the course of a month, I, I kind of wrote up all the things and then I had two months to practice. So when it came time to run payroll, I said, okay, let's sit down. Here's your checklist. And I made some edits as we went. Uh, and so then, all right, so then let's try it again next week or next time. 
and we did that and tweaked it some more and we got it to a point where you know it it, it went kind of flawless I don't, I don't think there was anything that they had a problem with at all if, if there was they didn't tell me or i haven't figured it out yet all right now the tech part of the interview comes in this question did you find any new documentation tools to help you through this process no okay <laughs> no. that's good i used word i used word okay with with a lot of links um no all right. Nothing, nothing fancy. Outlook and Word. Okay. Sometimes, and I say this to some prospects, um, I'm, I'm in the technology field and I pride myself on using technology to make process better, but not just for the sake of using technology. Because sometimes highlighters and sticky notes and paper clips are okay. It, 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 it's not necessarily a bad thing. So I don't feel like I have to go get some project planning, you know, Camino software. I just made work with what I had. Right. I made what I had work. Yeah. You well, know what I mean? No, I, I do. Cause I, I still use a lot of paper myself. So yeah, <laughs> just, just thought I'd ask though. So now let's go back to the actual walk. Mm-hmm. Um, the Camino, we, we kind of touched on a little bit of your process and, you know, what got you to that point, what motivated you to do that. But tell us about the actual walk, because you made the comment here and in the other podcast that, you know, it's probably a little harder than you thought. Mm-hmm. So for those who do not know what the El Camino del Santiago is, tell us what it is and then tell okay. us your, you know, journey okay. through it. So uh, Camino de Santiago is a pilgrimage um, that basically leads you to the tomb of the remains of uh, the Apostle James, one of Christ's followers back in the day. Uh, James the Greater, for those of you who know that there was two Jameses. And um, his remains were found in Spain um, in 800 AD and they built this cathedral and they've been, it took them a couple hundred years and they've been, people have been taking uh, this walk for over a thousand years. And it, it comes from a different, a couple of different spots. I'd say probably eight different spots and they all converge there. So the walk for me uh, is called the Camino Frances. It starts in France uh, in the French city of St. Jean Pied de Port, um, just o- at the foothills of the Pyrenees mountains in France. So the day one, uh, I went up, geez, uh, I think I was at 135 feet above sea level at the start. And then at the peak, uh, I was at 4,300. So not a mile, but, you know, it, it was a lot of up and it was over 13 miles. So you were basically walking up a, I don't know, 40 degree, 35 degree incline for about six hours. So it was a lot harder uh, than I thought, you know, kind of windy like switch, switch back. Like when you're skiing, uh-huh. like the opposite of that. Um, and you're kind of going up to make it a little, uh, a little easier. But this particular route that I went, there's two routes that you could have taken. This was called the Napoleon route because Napoleon actually took his army over into Spain from France that way, because when he went the other way, there was a, he would get ambushed and he was losing men. So he lost fewer men <laughs> uh, carrying all that crap up and over the Pyrenees Mountains. So that that part was super hard. And and one thing I discovered, which nobody really uh, mentioned uh, in the research that I was reading, was that down is a lot harder than up. Um, so up, it, you know, you feel it in your your calves, you feel it in your quads, and you feel it in your arms because you're using the walking sticks, you know to give you momentum and, um, and to kind of push you forward and to take some of the weight of the pack off of you. But when you go down, uh, your knees, uh, really take the brunt of it. Uh, and, uh, I mean, so I went up for 13 miles and then I went down for three. So 16 miles, which I had been used to that distance and I could do 16 miles in about five hours. Um, this took me almost 10. Um, so it was, it was a lot, it was a lot, lot harder. I, I rested at this one spot a little bit longer than I should have. I had a beer and I was reading a book, taking pictures, talking to people 
and I really should have been on my horse and, and going. But um, then, you know, you kind of throughout the northern Spain, there's um, a ton of villages through this up and down part, uh, tiny villages, hamlets even. They're, you know, sometimes I remember seeing some of them where the population was 40 or 19 or 100. And, uh, you know, the, the village may have five buildings, most of them farms, and then they may have a cafe uh, or a place to sleep. So we would, I would go from not village to village, but I would do about 17 miles per day. And I did that over 35 days um, to get to the end. I had two rest days in the middle uh, at around day 12 and around day 20. Uh, I met my wife on day 33 in a city called Saria. Uh, and then we walked five more days from there uh, to Santiago. And then we continued on in a car, thank God, the last 40 miles to get all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, which is a, a town called Finisterre, which means end of the earth, finished of the earth, the end of the earth, where Queen Isabella supposedly told Christopher Columbus to go find the new world. So the the walk itself for me, 575 miles, 35 days, uh, about 17 miles a day. I think I stayed in 32 or 33 different places. So I had to keep leaving the light on the bathroom because I didn't know where the hell I was every time I woke yeah. up, you know, trying to figure out, uh, you know, how to pee. Right. Now, just so that everybody understands, this isn't something that you can just show up and do, Correct. Oh, no, it is. You totally can. Um, there's a couple of ways to do it. The accommodations that they have that people stay in, they they run the gamut from uh, albergues, uh, hostels, refugios, um, uh, hotels, inns, uh, old converted monasteries and convents and churches and stuff. They have a bunch of different ways that you could go. You can do it the planned way, which they refer to me as a spreadsheet pilgrim where I know where I'm staying every night. Right. And so all I had to do and this, I repeat all the time, the best thing about this journey was that I only had to worry about me. I didn't have to worry about work, wife, kids, car, money. I didn't have to worry about anything. It was just get up, get dressed, brush your teeth, put on your pack and go to this city. And they had this excellent little, uh, I called it the, the Camino um, tracking system. They're yellow arrows and they're in the road, they're on the trees, they're on the side of buildings. You can't really get lost and you, you make your way. And every three to five miles, there's food, water. Okay, uh, I was going to say, you had stay. to worry about that. If you didn't bring money, how did you, how did you eat and drink? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I say I didn't worry about money. I meant like paying bills. <laughs> I wasn't worried about, I wasn't worried about that, you know? So yeah, I had money with me and buying coffee, which the favorite thing there is cafe con leche, which is basically a cappuccino. And, you know, you bang a couple of those back and you'll have no trouble walking 17 miles. And then, um, you know, you, people go and they carry everything in their backpack. Um, and so you're, you're very uh, sparse about what you bring two pairs of underwear, two pairs of socks, two shirts, two pants, whatever. And you wash them every night uh, and you wear to bed what you're going to wear the following day while your other clothes dry and you carry everything with you and you go to a city and you say, okay, I'm done. And you say, do you got any rooms and not, not rooms. You got any beds? If you don't have any beds, do you have any rooms because the beds are really cheap. It's like a bunk house, like a, a auditorium with a bunch of bunk beds in it. That's the cheapest way. Or you could get a room at a hostel, just a private room, private bath, which is what I did. And um, and you and if there was no room at that inn, maybe there was another inn in the same town or you had to keep walking. So I didn't like the idea of the uncertainty of not knowing. Some people claim that that's one of the coolest things about it is not planning and just kind of going with the flow, which I was it, sometimes I was envious, but more times than not, I was more grateful for the way I did it because I knew where I was going every night and I got to take a carry on luggage with me with extra clothes and stuff uh, that was waiting for me every time that I made it to my destination. It was great. Interesting. So 
I was listening to another podcast, and for the life of me, don't know the name, and it was probably about a month or so ago, and it was a gentleman that was talking about um, helping people do mountain trips, you know, like, you know, people that, you know, climb Mount Rainier or Mount Kilimanjaro or whatever, and they talk about the process of um, most of them have to plan years, yeah, you know, in advance to do those because yeah. uh, of the type of of climb that it is. It's not just you walk up a mountain and walk back down. No. Uh, it's grueling. Yeah. And he was talking about the fact that everybody gets to the point where they hit the summit and they're all excited and all happy and you know taking their pictures and stuff, but they <laughs> don't think about the trip back down. So it was interesting <laughs> yeah. that you mentioned that and that reminded me of that podcast where he said, look, a lot of people, you know, they're fine going up, but it's the, it's the way down where we actually have more accidents, more losses. Uh, sure. Cause people don't plan it, for that. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, for me in the beginning, the first couple of days, I felt so prepared physically, even though I wasn't prepared for the, uh, the steep inclines or declines. But other than that, I was really prepared and I felt really good. I felt really strong, probably healthier than I've been uh, in 20 years, maybe longer. And um, as I would approach a pilgrim on the trail, you know, you'd kind of overtake them um, because your pace was just greater than theirs. And so you'd come up and the, and the watchword out there is Buen Camino. And I saw that you had it on the yep. on your, your cover art. And Buen Camino means good way. It just means you know, have a good trip at be say bon voyage, basically, but the Spanish version of that. And so you'd say that to people and, and then they, you know, they'd look up at you and, and you could kind of tell the ones who were struggling. And, and so struggling is like, you know, they're winded, their, their muscles aren't ready for it. Maybe their feet, which was a big problem. Their feet were giving them a problem. Might They might have blisters or in, in a lot of cases, a lot of cases, people lost toenails because the down, your shoe is hitting the the front of your, or your foot is hitting the front of the shoe and, you know, people have black toenails and then they fall off. It's kind of gross. But um, I, in the beginning, I felt so good. I was like asking people, are you okay? Are you okay? Can I help you? Do you need something? Cause I had so much stuff. I had helped people with everything from electrolytes because people were like sweating out and I came across this one lady that was shaking and I used the stuff that said, it was like, I forget what it was called. Noom electrolyte powder. And I put it in a water bottle and I drank it. And I swear two minutes later, she was rock steady. And I was like, wow, that shit really works. Mm. (laughs) They said that it would work like that. And I was like, I have like 20 packets of it because I overdo everything. So, and I helped a bunch of people with blisters and I had other medication and I actually popped people's blisters and gave them the, the right, um, medication or the right bandage for it, because that was probably the biggest problem out there. And I, I'm telling people the story that if you watched YouTube and you read a book about how to drive a clutch, how to drive a manual transmission car, could you do it? And that's how it was with me with all this blister care. And they were calling me footman and Dr. Scholl and, you know, oh, here he comes. He's got all the stuff. <laughs> so at some cafe, I would show up And they'd be like, oh, my God, Tom, you got to help me. So I I was helping a lot of people along the way. And that was one of the really great gifts that came out of that. That was interesting. Your reputation preceded you (laughs) along the journey there. Yes. Where uh, my my one of my walking partners who happened to be a mountain climber and he climbed uh, Aconcagua in Argentina and he did uh, Mount Rainier and he did a couple other things. He was talking about the, the process that uh, you get trail legs after a while, after a couple of days or couple of weeks where it becomes easier for you right. uh, to, to go. And then at some point you get up and you just hop out of bed and you're going to bang out 15, 20 miles. It's really incredible the, how the human body uh, does that. But he said to me, he's like, you're like a Navy SEAL. He says two is one and one is none. He goes, you have backups to your backups. I'm like, yeah, I'm a data guy. Yeah, <laughs> so I, say, I don't yes. trust anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we are coming up to the top of the hour. Um, you are going to stay with us through the post show for those of you that are watching, uh, please stay with us and, uh, we will continue this. If you're listening to the audio, 
uh, get over to the show notes and uh, you can uh, find the video link to the show here and you can join back in at this point. So, Tom, before we end off, I want to ask you for two comments in terms of what you found most enlightening, most beneficial, um, whatever term you want to use, but one professionally and one personally. Um, does that have to be one word? <laughs> um, <laughs> no. So I'm going to say personally, because I people say, oh, I want to hear all about it. And I say, you don't have enough time. Um, profound. Um, it affected me in really good, healthy ways, right? So personally, um, what I did, what I was able to accomplish, uh, it was a big deal. Um, and then professionally, so from a business standpoint, um, it gave me clarity. Um, so when I came back, it was easy for me to see and to realize things that were wrong and things that I needed to do right, if that makes sense, because I see those as two different things. Okay. The action I needed to take uh, without any, without reacting to something. So there was stuff I was going to react to and stuff that I was going to create. So profound and clarity. Okay. All right, folks, uh, you have heard a very riveting story, both personally and professionally, <laughs> with uh, Tom Bull and his uh, walk on the El Camino de Santiago. And uh, we're going to continue on with discussion. I have more questions, but they're going to be more of a personal nature, and we'll continue those after the show. And um, I may have him come back because there's a lot to unwrap there. And uh, I think you actually mentioned a lot of business things that people need to pay attention to and definitely getting things out of your head and into processes for other people. Uh, something huge, something huge. So that's going to do it for this episode, folks. Uh, just a programming note. There will not be a live show next week. And the reason is ASCII. We'll be down here in Miami next Tuesday and Wednesday. So I will be in Miami uh, for that conference. I'm actually leading a panel session. I'm doing a member meeting. Uh, I will be doing some on the, on the scene podcast there. So there will be content next week. There just won't be a live show. So be on the lookout for those. And that's going to do it for this episode. I thank Tom Bull for joining us and sharing his personal journey. And uh, we'll see you next time. And until then, holla.